Uh, thank you. Thank you. Very, oops. Thank you very much. Um, I myself am just back from a trip to, to Beijing that um, our co-host here, Tsui Chow, uh, organized, uh, graciously organized for us. And I must say, I come back with a great deal of conviction about the need, the value, and the opportunities there are from uh, China-U.S. cultural investment. I, I just think it's very important. Now, I'm a president of a, of a university, um, and I, of course, focus on my mission, which is to educate young people to go out into this world. Uh, but I think it's just one part, one part of, of global cultural uh, collaboration. So I'm glad to be part of this today. First, let me just say a word about the format. Uh, I'm going to up here introduce all four present uh, panelists, and then each of them will come up and present, and then when the presentations are done, all, all of us will come up uh, here for a question, uh, question and answer uh, session. Now, before I actually introduce the panelists, so I want to share some of my own perspective on U.S.-China collaboration as, as the president of, of the New School. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the New School is a unique institution uh, based here in New York City. Uh, we are the only university in the world that has a large comprehensive design school, Parsons School of Design, uh, together with very strong social sciences, humanities, and performing arts, a humanistic, a humanistic approach. And in what we do, we focus on the intersection of, of design and creativity and social engagement. When I say design, what I mean by design is how do we organize objects, uh, people, uh, and environments uh, to make the world a, a better place. So it ranges from fine art through fashion all the way through technology uh, and various kinds of industrial, industrial design. Um, and because of, of, of how I defined it, it means that it's really about human interface. Uh, it's about user interface. It's about how people interact with those things. Uh, and that's what makes it very important at the New School to be uh, that the fact that we do have very strong social sciences, humanities, and, and performing arts. Um, the New School is also unique in another way. Uh, we're very highly international. Uh, we were the first major university to establish uh, a campus in, uh, outside the U.S. And, and Parsons Paris was formed in, 19, in the early 1920s, 1921 to be precise. Another major part of our early history was the university in exile. Uh, we provided safe haven for a number of European scholars who were fleeing the, fleeing the Holocaust. Uh, and today, you know, all across the New School in Parsons, we have a broad range of uh, partnerships, international partnerships and collaborations, especially in China. Uh, just the other day, uh, I had wanted to consult with one of our faculty members, and I was told, oh, he's in China working on a project. Um, it, was a, it was a project I hadn't even, even heard of, uh, that, but that's not unusual. That's not unusual at the New School. And finally, at the New School, we have um, over a third of our students come from outside the U.S. And of that group, uh, about 900 or 1,000 come from China out of our 10,000 students. So we have a very strong uh, just uh, interest directly at the school in collaboration, uh, collaboration with China. We very much hope to establish uh, and are working on some significant partnerships. Uh, we want them to be large scale. We don't want to do uh, we don't want to do small things there. I must say, to this point, our our partners in China have have demonstrated a, a strong willingness to collaborate, uh, appreciation for what design education actually means, uh, and <clears throat> an openness to innovative models of, of teaching. And finally, it's generosity. I have always been welcomed very well. Uh, uh, something I greatly greatly appreciate. Um, so let me now turn to our, um, uh, to our speakers today. And um, uh, I'll start with Edward Chang. Uh, Edward is the vice president of Tencent. He joined the company in 2009. Uh, he oversees strategy, marketing, uh, marketing channels, copyright, new business development for uh, the Tencent's interactive entertainment uh, group. Uh, he also manages Tencent's overall branding, marketing, and PR. Uh, since 2011, his PAN Entertainment Strategy, uh, which is Internet-Enabled Transmedia Strategies, has become one of the fundamental uh, development strategies for, um, for the uh, interactive uh, entertainment group. 
The, at Tencent, um, the Interactive Entertainment Group has gradually launched its platform for comic, comic books, literature, film, and television, and esports. Edward has an EMBA from Molin School of Business in, in, at Washington University, as well as a BS, he told me just now, in physics from Tsinghua University. Our second speaker uh, will be Lady Julian Sackler. Uh, she is among many things, the president and CEO of the Dame Gillian and Dr. Arthur M. Sackler Foundation for Arts, Sciences, and Humanities. She has also been the first um, female uh, chairperson of the Foreign Policy Association. Uh, she is the founder, patron, and honorary director of the Arthur M. Sackler Museum of Art and Archaeology uh, at Peking University. Uh, she is on the board of the Foundation for National Institutes of Health, as well as a trustee of the Royal Academy of Arts uh, uh, in London, as well as the American Film Institute. Uh, and finally, she's a visiting committee member and fellows advisory council member at Harvard, uh, of Harvard University's art museums. Our third uh, panelist is Joe Malilo. He is the executive producer at the uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music, uh, commonly known as BAM. He's been doing that since 1999. Uh, he's responsible for uh, the artistic direction, programming. Uh, previously, he was BAM's producer and director and founding director of the Next Wave Festival. Uh, he has fostered works of emerging and established art artists and forged many international partnerships. Uh, he has a number of uh, accolades that I won't go through all of them. The one I uh, uh, like the best is being a Knight of the Royal Order of the Polar Star, uh, which is from Sweden. Uh, uh, finally, he's a member of the International Advisory Committee for the Wexner Prize, uh, as well as a uh, 2017 juror for the Gish Prize. And our final uh, uh, panel, uh, panelist is Jay Levinson. Jay, uh, since 1996, has been a director of the international program at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. He manages the museum's exchange and research programs with institutions in other countries. Uh, he was previously deputy director um, of, for program administration at the Guggenheim Museum, uh, where he helped prepare such major exhibitions as China, 5,000 Years, which was in 1998, and Africa, The Art of a Continent, in 1996. Uh, he's a guest curator for major uh, um, expositions uh, involving uh, all sorts of countries around the world. He has a PhD in art history from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU, and uh, he has a BA from Yale, and finally, he is a classmate of mine uh, at Yale Law School. So, a uh, welcome to all of our panelists. So, uh, let me now ask uh, Edward, Edward Cheng to come up and make his presentation. Edward? Uh, dis distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to, and a privilege to be here in New York today uh, for the China-U.S. Cultural uh, Investment Forum. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Vice President Tan uh, for your kind invitation, and also congratulate Asia Society for hosting the much expected forum today. Uh, actually, during a visit last year to Cornell Tech Campus in New York City, uh, Mr. Pony Ma, co-founder and the CEO of Tencent Group, uh, proposed a new corporate strategy for Tencent. Uh, we, are become, we are to become a company of technology plus culture. Most people here actually would know about the technology side of Tencent, including uh, the China uh, social network, WeChat and QQ, and also the most recent uh, artificial intelligence development. But actually today, I would like to take this opportunity to share Tencent's new experiments uh, in the culture arena. Uh, actually, one of our game product called Honor of Kings, or the other name is the Arena of Valor, uh, as its overseas version is called, is the first Chinese mobile game to reach over 10 million daily active users outside of China. It is not only the most successful game of Tencent, but also the most popular mobile game in the world uh, in, term of, in terms of uh, registered users. A large number of these uh, characters in the game are based on the images of historical or classic literary figures in China. Uh, some of them are from, from three kingdoms. Uh, some of them are from the uh, journey west. Uh, recently, its users have discovered a new way of playing. 
they can donate their game pawns and redeem them to help support the rural women in China to make uh, handcraft scarves. In return, all the game players will get new game skins or gears from us as a reward. With this small innovation, users in the game uh, can now have fun playing games, enjoy Chinese traditional culture, and do charity work, all at the same time. Now, charity as part of the production and consumption of popular culture uh, is just one of the many happy surprises of what digital technology and social networks can bring to us. Since its inception uh, 20 years ago, Tencent uh, as a company has been committed to building connections and creating content. WeChat, uh, which is well known as our multi-purpose mega app, has already over 1 billion uh, registered users globally, with more than 200 million overseas users. QQ is uh, another social media app of Tencent, has more than 800 million users. In addition to these two big platforms, in the past seven years, uh, Tencent as a company, we have built a huge ecosystem of digital content, including online games, literature, animation and comics, uh, through a practice that we call Pan Entertainment Strategy. In this ecosystem, tens of millions of creators are constantly producing digital cultural products for the world and for the audience all over the world. In the process, a couple of questions constantly popped up. How to generate and nurture more creative ideas and new cultural products? How to ensure the healthy and sustainable growth of the digital ecosystem? We have come up with an initiative of the so-called new culture creativity and decided to turn to uh, traditional culture for new insights for technology in 2016, we met the curator of the Palace Museum, Mr. Shan Jixiang, which in my opinion is a man of vision and ambition. Both of us believe that the traditional culture shouldn't only stay on the wall to be appreciated. It should also find a way to attract young people today. We quickly found a common ground on which to work together and we co-organized an annual design competition for young talents to design digital products with elements from the China Forbidden City. Popular products including an interactive H H5 of the rapping Ming Dynasty Emperor Zhu Di that got viral via WeChat platform. Also includes a series of emoji stickers based on the image of Meng Hai. Actually, Meng Hai is the name of the uh, firefighting water tanks in the Forbidden City. And those emojis were used 40 million times a month uh, in the QQ, which is one of the biggest uh, social uh, network in China for, from Tencent. So through transmedia practice, the charm of traditional culture has not been reduced in the digital age. Rather, it has formed a new cool among new young people. Traditional culture has found its new way back to our modern life. The initial success was really encouraging for us. However, cultural heritage based innovation often raise some uh, concerns. Are we projecting a simplistic version of our profound Chinese culture? Will the new, newly found interest in traditional culture a passing fad? Our immediate challenge is to turn short-lived joy into a long-lasting appreciation and participation and help traditional culture find its new way into the daily life of the young Chinese people. We are determined to move forward and push our cultural experiment to the next level. So in the collaboration with the Palace Museum, we launched a mini program called Find Your Way in the Forbidden City. Because you know Forbidden City in China is such a huge city and there is more than tens of thousands of people every day in the city. So uh, through that kind of mini program, we, helping, we are helping visitors with their needs when touring the Forbidden City. For example, everybody needed to find a toilet. So we also build a game and the quiz functions 
into the program for users to gain literacy about the myths in and also stories about the Forbidden City. So all the different rooms which Quinn and which King have ever lived in. Our innovation with tangible culture heritage is focused on facilitating uses. When it comes to intangible culture heritage, we have emphasized generating new content. Last year, a Quan Chu music themed skin in the game of honor of kings came online. User purchasing the skin would hear a section of the classic Ming Dynasty Quan Chu opera named as the Peony Pavilion. Would the ancient Quan Chu songs be popular with young people because they are thousands of years distance from today? Yu Yu, which is uh, one of our uh, product manager, among other project managers, was actually at the first beginning not confident about this. He think the young people might not be able to appreciate the ancient kind of melody. But as soon as the singing of the Quan Chi master, Mr. Wei Chunrong started, all the doubt vanished. Everyone was charmed by the beautiful melody and the voice. Users including the young people today, love it very much. Recently, the game launched a new skin featuring Dunhuang Fei Tian, or the flying goddess. Actually, three hours ago, I received all the pictures and the videos from my team. The King of Glory are hosting a big concert together with some Chinese traditional culture organizations. And there's 6,000 young people to watch that concert and they give me the number, there is more than 25 million uh, online viewers for that concert, which is three hours ago back in China. So let me tell another story about Dunhuang. Uh, actually, last month, Dunhuang Institute and the Tencent QQ Music Platform, we together uh, organized a special outdoor concert uh, outside of the caves of Dunhuang and under the starry sky of Dunhuang. The music played was either translated from the ancient music charts uncovered in the, in the Dunhuang Caves or recreated with inspirations from those charts. Some of the music instruments used at that concert, for example, the name of the instruments uh, are Kong Hou uh, and Bi Li, uh, reproduced based on the murals of Dunhuang Caves. 10 million people watched the live stream of the concert worldwide that night. All stakeholders have benefited from the collaboration. Traditional culture has found a new way into the modern people's uh, daily life. Tencent's content team have drawn upon traditional culture to create popular products that, you, that users can enjoy. In the past two years, through our partnerships with such prestigious culture institutions as the Palace Museum, the Great Wall, Dunhuang, and also the Terracotta ter Warriors. A rich and a vibrant content ecosystem has been uh, taken shape. We believe that innovation is the best way to preserve our traditional culture. And consumption is the best way to inherit our heritage. The popularity of the digital forms of traditional culture among young people today will not only help with the success of digital platforms, but also sustain and enrich traditional culture itself. The cooperation between Tencent and Dunhuang exemplifies Tencent's new culture creativity strategy. Specifically, 11 products in Tencent Group, from Tencent Charity, QQ Music, to Honor of Kings and Tencent Map, are all part of a partnership. They have worked together to figure out new ways to attract as many young people as possible to the cause. I want to share with you an interesting case uh, that has shown the power of innovation by thinking out of the box. Audience who know the history of Dunhuang may have heard the word patron. It is generations after generations of them that had financed uh, the amazing construction work of Dunhuang Caves. We hope to continue this tradition using digital technology and attract young people to join the cultural plantation work in Dunhuang. 
Actually, we launched an inter interactive H5 campaign displaying more than 50 pieces of Dunhuang murals and allow each person to donate as low as 90 cents via WeChat pay to become a digital patron. Within the first hour, it was shared by millions of young people. All donated are used to restore the st statues and murals in the number 15.5 cave in Dunhuang. So some celebrities have also participated and brought more young people to follow the lead. So traditional culture and Tencent's unique social network plus content platform are nourishing and enriching each other, giving shape to a comprehensive inheritance system of multiple stakeholders and multiple forms of actions. This system allows cultural heritage to come out of museum and research labs and walk into the leisure and the daily life of ordinary people. Enabled by digital technology and the digital platforms, ordinary people are able to join the rank of creators, form their own communities, and defend their cultural identities. Against this innovative setting, creative works with product profound cultural impact have emerged. A recent movie produced by Tencent Picture, uh, Shadow, directed by a very renowned Chinese film director, Zhang Yimou, has won the hearts of a global audience at the Venice Film Festival, uh, and also won 12 Golden Horse Award nominations. Uh, through its exquisite, uh, exquisite artistic design using Tai Chi and the traditional Chinese painting elements. And this is what we call, okay, uh, my time is up, so I'm going to finish short. The famous British poet T.S. Eliot once said, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place to be the first time. Digital technology is more than a form for carrying and processing content. Rather, it bears the essential functions of content generation, expression, and dissemination. Like any technology revolution in the history, digitalization is not only there for content migration, but also for content production. Tencent's exploration will fall ahead. We welcome partners from all over the world to join the journey. Um, I sincerely wish we can work together to ensure that the technology and the culture shine together for the benefit of each other and for the benefit of each of us in the world. I would like to conclude my talk with a one minute, one minute read, uh, video, please. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. Thank you to the Asia Society and the Beijing Contemporary Art Foundation for inviting me to participate in this meeting. I'm afraid I don't have a very nice video, and I don't have any slides. Since 1980, I have been president of a foundation in support of the arts, sciences, and humanities. I have been making cultural investments in the United States, Europe, and Asia for many years. I have a long record of cultural investment in China. I built the first teaching museum in China, named for my late husband, the Arthur M. Sackler Museum of Art and Archaeology at Peking University celebrates its 25th anniversary this year. Not only was it the first teaching museum in China, but it was the first museum in China built to state-of-the-art Western standards with temperature and humidity control, display cases from Germany, lighting from Czechoslovakia, facilities for good storage and conservation, and offices and classrooms. The Shanghai Museum, which is obviously world-class and far larger, opened a few years later. The idea for the teaching museum came from my late husband. Arthur is known for his art collection, collecting, although actually that was a hobby. His profession was as a medical doctor and research psychiatrist. He had his own laboratory and was nominated for the Nobel Prize for his research into schizophrenia. At the time Arthur died in 1987, he had amassed approximately 25,000 art objects. He collected art from all over the world, but his main love was for Chinese art, and he had the largest private collection of Chinese art in the West. That is why the Smithsonian came calling, and when he allowed them to pick a thousand masterpieces, the National Museum of Asian Art was named for him, i.e. the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery in Washington, D.C., he also collected other Asian art, European art, pre-Columbian art, all kinds. He began by collecting American paintings as an impoverished medical student. He lent objects to numerous institutions for exhibition or study, including the Asia Society. In 1976, he was invited to China by Chairman Mao, not because of his art collecting, but, be, but to advise their Ministry of Public Health. He knew every aspect of medicine, including government, pharmaceuticals, marketing, research, and he started the first medical newspaper, which was sent to all doctors free to keep them up to date with the latest developments, techniques, and ethical discussions. He was the best all-round expert on health in the world. Somehow, the Chinese knew this. Mao died that year, but Deng Xiaoping renewed the invitation. Arthur made many recommendations and got on very well with the Minister of Public Health. In the early 1980s, he was allowed to set up an office in Beijing where China Medical Tribune was published. This company was co-owned by the Minister, Ministry of Public Health and any profits were split between the government and the foundation to use for uh, cultural and health projects in China. It became the top professional publication in China for many years. This was a tremendously important cultural contribution, disseminating news of the latest Western medicine throughout China. My husband's Medical Tribune group published around the world, going to 20 countries in eight languages. He had offices in the Americas, Europe, and Asia. When we went to China in 1980, we were given a tour of the country. Arthur remarked that the Chinese people seemed unaware of their heritage and artifacts, which was so important. He said we were building a teaching museum at Harvard and we could do the same for China. Over the years, this project progressed slowly. Arthur suggested the authorities could pick the best university and Peking University was chosen as it, has, has the best, as it had the best archeology span department. He spoke to I.M. Pei about the project, and I.M. suggested a protege, Lo Yi Chan, a young Chinese-American architect. Then in 1987, my husband died. I was trying to pick up the pieces with many of our projects around the world. The Chinese were not impressed with art. They were focused on science and technology. 
There were some museums, often storing books or old photographs and memorabilia, nothing like a Western art museum. Even the Palace Museum had no climate control and wonderful things languished in dark, dusty cases. Peking University insisted the proposed building fit in with the traditional style buildings on campus. Then came Tiananmen Square. Many people here, even governmental, advised me against going ahead. I had to make a hard decision, but decided it was an educational, cultural contribution which would hopefully lead to better relations across the world. The Sackler Museum at Beida opened in 1993. It was the first air-conditioned building on campus. In the interim years, there, have, there has been an explosion of interest in art, and the Chinese now know the importance of art and museums. In fact, they have embarked on a massive building program. I have read that between 2011 and 2015, a particularly productive construction period, museums opened at an average of almost one a day in China. At the beginning, the galleries in the new Sackler Museum displayed ancient Chinese art in historical timeline. I suggested that to celebrate the opening, there should be a scholarly symposium on the latest archaeological findings attended by Chinese and Western scholars. I invited 20 Western scholars and the university invited around 70 Chinese scholars. The proceedings were published. Little did I know when I had the idea that it would be the first time Chinese and Western archaeologists had met together in a hundred years. We had another East-West symposium to celebrate the 10th anniversary, and now such meetings happen more frequently. Therefore, the Sackler Museum has helped to foster study and cooperation and help spread the latest information about ancient Chinese art throughout the world. The Sackler Museum at Beida now shows exhibitions of European art, and in 2013, to, to celebrate the 20th anniversary, I began a program of contemporary art with an international artist picked to have an exhibition and explain their work to the students. One condition that the winner has to fulfill is to show through their art our common humanity. These exhibitions have received critical acclaim in China. This year, for the 25th anniversary, we invited the five winners back to present new work and in addition invited other Western and Chinese artists to join. In total, there were 14 artists, including Zhu Bing and Zhang Wang. Incidentally, the chief curator and manager of the program, who really made it happen, is here today, Miguel Benavides. He spends a great deal of time organizing the exhibitions and then stays in China for about a month prior to the opening, and he has been hailed by the museum staff as our teacher. This year's exhibition was a bit crowded as space is limited, and the museum is due to be expanded next year. I have also sponsored Sackler Scholars to travel from the Sackler Museum to be trained at the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery in Washington, D.C. for six months each. As you know, in the 90s, many Chinese scholars who came to U.S. universities did not return. That was before the tremendous success of the new China economy and the enormous expansion of wealth and power of the People's Republic. I am happy to say that all the students we sponsored returned to work at the Sackler Museum. Although one vice director married an Australian and is now curator of Asian art at the New South Wales Gallery in Sydney. In my negotiations with PKU, the only condition I sought which was problematic was that the museum should be open to the public, as the Sackler Museum at Harvard would be. PKU does honor this, but one needs to show identification at the campus gates or make a prior appointment. This is workable. I'm glad to say that groups of school kids visit regularly, and the university leaders frequently take VIP visitors to view the museum. Everyone at the university was and is very proud of it. I am proud to have started a trend because it has also inspired numerous other universities in China to create their own teaching museums. 
Also in China, not under the auspices of PKU, in 1990, I initiated a program of competitions to encourage the ancient art of Chinese calligraphy, and exhibitions have been held in various cities in China, in Singapore and the United States. At first, the program launched with the help of staff from my late husband's company, and later became so important that another group took over. I have also sponsored other art exhibitions around China. Plus, I have sponsored medical research in China into Kashen Beck's disease. I have been involved with cultural institutions in the United Kingdom, such as the Royal Academy of Arts in London, where I have been on the board since the 1980s, and established the Sackler Wing of Galleries with architect Norman Foster, which won Building of the Year 1992 from the Royal Institute of British Architects. Also in the United Kingdom from 1986 to 1991, 1986 to 1991, I was international chairman for the Edinburgh Festival, during which time the foundation sponsored several art exhibitions and conferences, as well as productions of Giancarlo Menotti's The Consul and The Saint of Bleecker Street. Among other cultural exchanges, in 2006, the foundation presented the Chinese film Song of Tibet at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. I am a trustee of the Friends of Mexican Development Foundation and have served as a trustee of the U.S. Committee of UNICEF and as a member of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. I am on various other boards in the U.S., such as the American Film Institute, and the foundation of the National Institutes of Health. But the most relevant for today is probably the Foreign Policy Association, where I am chairman. The FPA celebrates its centennial this year. In fact, the gala was two, day, two, day, two nights ago. I became chairman four years ago, and I am the first female chairperson in 96 years. I am not a foreign policy specialist, but the reason I was tapped is because they said cultural diplomacy is so important now and that I had been doing it on my own for a long time. I believe that the more interaction there can be through culture across borders, the more understanding there will be between peoples. The world is becoming increasingly dangerous and cultural exchanges can bring information and education and contribute towards peace. Think of ping pong diplomacy in 1971. Therefore, I heartily endorse cultural investment and hope we can encourage and entice more people to get involved. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so I want to thank the Asia Society for inviting me. And uh, now we're going to test whether or not I can actually be a technologist. So, BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music, is the formal title. And, uh, are we, uh, this is not gonna work unless you manipulate it to the next slide. <laughs> this is, the other one, there, as I said. We're, see, we're going to see if I can do this. All right. So here, my presentation is about giving you a lesson in geography first. We're in Brooklyn. We're not in Manhattan, where all of you are seated at this moment. So history. This is the cultural district of Brooklyn. Brooklyn cultural district. This is the original Brooklyn Academy of Music, which was in Brooklyn Heights, which is right over the Manhattan Bridge. This building had an opera house. It opened in 1861. Guess what? There was no bridge between the city of Brooklyn and the city of Manhattan. You would go to Lower Manhattan and take a ferry, or you, you would use barge system to get goods and, that you needed for manufacturing. This is what it looked like on Montague Street. 
1903, enormous fire destroys the original building. But in 1903, the city of Brooklyn was now the borough of Brooklyn. And in 1898, when that happened, the Brooklyn Bridge was created, allowing for transportation from the borough of Manhattan to the borough of Brooklyn. This was 1908, the opening of the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And inside is an opera house, and that is the opera house, seating 2,000 people. This is what the front of the building looks like today. This is what our ever-lovely audiences look like. Again, the opera house. This is the former ballroom of that building, which is at 30 Lafayette Avenue. It is now the BAM Cafe. 20 years ago now, we became a performing and cinema arts center, and this is our largest cinema. One of the other cinemas. In 1987, we acquired our second theater, not in the main building, one city block away. It, is in, it was named in honor of the man who hired me in 1983, Harvey Lichtenstein. Unique architectural design, very important that you know it has a unique architectural design, modeled upon Peter Brooks Theater in Paris called Le Bouffe de Nord, 850 seats. The back wall is legendary for its unique design. In 2012, I opened our third theater, the Richard B. Fisher Building, it contains a completely flexible theater seating 250 people. This is the rehearsal studio. This is the rooftop terrace. So, 1983 is when I entered the Brooklyn Academy of Music BAM to create this festival. The Next Wave Festival is the largest non-traditional contemporary performing arts program in the United States of America. All three main stage theaters operate from the months of October to December. We're right in the middle of it now. Our winter spring season, completely different. It's a curated program of individual works of art that I assemble in all artistic disciplines, theater, dance, music, opera. And again, all three theaters are used to support this artistic program. All right, so seven years ago, the United States government had a problem. The problem was they didn't know how to get American dance into the global community. The, the senior program officer came to me knowing about my artistic program at BAM to solve their problem. The problem was they kept on thinking about they wanted to tour. And, and I explained to them, if you're going to tour, then you're not going to have cultural diplomacy. And the Secretary of State her name was Hillary Clinton at that time, had created a program of person-to-person -person cultural diplomacy. So what I did, I became the architect of a residence program. I curated the American dance companies, the uh, Department of State Education and Cultural Division selected the global community that they wanted the American dance company to travel. And the structure of that program was that the company would be in residence at their global location for one solid week, a minimum of seven days. And what I did was to do the advance trip to work with the consulate or the embassy, working to find NGOs, non-government organizations within their communities. The first thing that the consulate and embassy said, we don't have a modern dance company here. I said, we don't want to work with a modern dance company. We want to work with the people. I want to meet 
educators. I want to meet children. I want to meet senior citizens. I want to go into the community for what is called community engagement. So I was, found myself in a teaching position with our US government, as with the representatives and embassies and consulates, explaining what community engagement means and how artists can advance that policy of cultural diplomacy, person-to-person -person exchange, interaction. And what did they discover? They discovered that the American dancer is verbal and they like working with people in studios, obviously, on stages, obviously, but also in grassy landscapes, on cement, in gymnasiums, because they're adaptable. The key here and the takeaway is each one of these programs was artisanal. What I did in China, I didn't do in Indonesia. And what I did in Indonesia, I did not do in South America, in Brazil or Chile. Each one of them is individual and unique, taking into consideration the identity of the culture that we were going to be guests working within. Right now, this is from the Next Wave Festival. This is a Swedish company. This is an opera by the American Philip Glass. This is the folk opera from Stockholm, Sweden. This particular program, the opera is called Satagraha, is a collaboration between a contemporary circus company and an opera company. This is the first time that Philip Glass's opera will be presented back at that Harvey Theater, that 850 seat theater. The last time it was done in New York City was at the Metropolitan Opera, almost 4,000 seats. Philip Glass has never seen his opera this intimate or handled by this group of artists in this way. Now, basically what I want all of you to understand is that BAM is a creative problem solver in cultural diplomacy. We are the largest presenter of global artists in all discipline. Where we have China represented in our cinema program. Again, my bringing an American dance company, we were, the government selected China, we went primarily to Beijing and Shanghai. Thirdly, I'm an artistic director. I'm a curator of the performing arts so that we have in our programs, both the Next Wave Festival and in our winter spring season, is to program work from China in the contemporary and the traditional idioms. So what we have is a platform for cultural exchange. So creative problem solver, cultural diplomacy, happening in Brooklyn. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm Jay Levinson, the director of the international program at MoMA. Our museum is best known uh, for its you know, location on 53rd Street. We get three million people a year. We have many exhibitions, uh, a, a collection that goes back to the 19, it was started in the 1930s, and is generally regarded as the most important Western collection of uh, modern and contemporary art. My story is a bit of a back of the house story. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk about our work because it's not usually covered in the media. My explanation usually is that the media are interested in our exhibitions, certainly. Mm -hmm. And other than that, they're really interested often in scandals, which are very useful for, for their purposes. We haven't created any scandals yet, and as you'll see, we don't directly work in exhibitions. Originally, my department did circulate uh, exhibitions internationally, but now we're focused on a very different mission. We're trying to connect the Museum of Modern Art, which traditionally has had its closest international collaborations with Western Europe, we're trying to connect it to the rest of the world. So our emphasis is on Asia, Latin America, 
Eastern Europe, and to some extent, Africa. And we've uh, come up with a number of different programs to facilitate those connections. I'll just go through them all briefly. Uh, one of them is a publication series called Primary Documents. Uh, we started it in uh, 2002, and we've published nine books so far. They're all collections translated into English of important writings on modern and contemporary, usually modern art, from different parts of the world. So we call them primary documents because they, they're writings by artists, often artist manifestos. They're early criticism, uh, and they deal with different time periods depending upon the country involved. So we started with a book on uh, Eastern Europe, uh, we've also done three books on Latin America, Argentina, um, Venezuela, and Brazil. Uh, one on uh, Sweden, the primary documents of Swedish design had never been translated into English. Uh, uh, and several on Asia, uh, so far a Chinese volume, which I'll go into in more detail, and a Japanese volume. And most recently, a volume on uh, the origins of modern art in the Arab world, and a follow-up volume on Eastern Europe after 1989. Uh, our Chinese volume uh, came out several years ago. It was uh, edited by Professor Wu Hong of the University of Chicago. Uh, and it has writing starting in the 1970s and going up to the, uh, the end of the 20th century. Again, very often art writings by artists or criticism from that period to give you an idea of the development of contemporary art uh, in China. Um, it's not been published in Chinese, only in English, but among other things, it's really facilitated the teaching of contemporary Chinese art in American universities. That's one of the things that Wu Hong had very much on its mind. And it's also helped within our museum to focus our curators uh, more closely on art from China, which is a subject very few of them knew very much about um, before the book came out. Uh, we've also had a series of workshops for international museum people. Uh, we started um, again back in the early 2000s, uh, and the first idea was to bring a group of uh, international museum professionals to MoMA for about two weeks. We took some of the groups to uh, different parts of the United States as well, mostly to the West Coast. So we started with a group from Latin America. Each one was about 15 curators and other museum administrators. Uh, we had a group from Central and Eastern Europe, an East Asian group. I think if you look at the, uh, far, if I can get this going. So, there we go. At the, uh, anyway, at, at the very left margin, you'll see Wang Huangsheng, who went on to be a very important uh, museum director in China, in Guangzhou, and then at Kaffa in Beijing, and another group on, uh, sub, from Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, that's the East Asian group, sort of a, a close-up. You can see uh, some of the people more clearly, and that's when we took them to Los Angeles. I thought New York gives a very incomplete picture of the United States. So does Los Angeles, but it's so different from New York. The two together seem to be a good, a good combination. And then we've continued it more recently in a very different way. Um, in, uh, the, the, the more recent development is, again, a two-week session, but we collaborate with another organization in New York, the Center for Curatorial Leadership, uh, and we offer the participants a series of management courses taught by Columbia University business school professors. Uh, and um, we've had four classes so far, uh, and we've had participants from M Plus in Hong Kong, uh, from Kaffa in Beijing, and uh, also someone who works for the Pali Cultural Group servicing new museums in China. So this is, and we also this time include in each group uh, several curators from MoMA. So this is a way that we've been able to establish an international network of, uh, of curators with whom we hope to stay in touch on a long-term basis. We're also hoping that the people who meet each other in, uh, in these groups, because these are international groups, they're not from any one uh, part of the world, we hope that they'll not only come up with projects in the future uh, that affect MoMA, but also that they'll come up with projects uh, among, each, among themselves. And our understanding is so far that that has worked out. We're planning a reunion event for all four classes within the next year, and we'll find out, I hope, 
in a, be in a more complete way exactly what's happened in terms of subsequent collaborations. Uh, so the most important international uh, project we do now is a research project called CMAP, Contemporary and Modern Art Perspectives. And uh, it consists of uh, four curatorial groups. Um, each one's made up again of roughly 15 curators, but also other uh, museum uh, staff members in, in program departments in the museum. Uh, and uh, they work on Africa, Asia, you'll see in the next slide, also Eastern Europe, uh, and Latin America. And what the groups do is they invite scholars to come, and, and curators and artists to come to New York to meet with them at least twice a month. So they get a grounding in uh, art from different parts of the world. And they also take at least one trip to the area that they're studying. There's a group leader who's one of our senior curators, and there's also a, a fellow. Uh, the program has been supported through a combination of internal and external funding. We had a very important grant from the Mellon Foundation while we were uh, organizing uh, th this project, and our own International Council, which is a donors group, has continued to support it. So it's mostly, uh, uh, it's an ongoing um, program. We thought originally it would probably last just a few years, but it's very clear it needs to last for a much longer time for our staff to get a good grounding in art from parts of the world that they probably didn't learn about in graduate school. Uh, so just to show you, our, our uh, Asian group started out working on Japan, uh, worked on China and Korea, and is now focused on South Asia. So India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. That's just a, a photograph of one of their trips to India, meeting with an artist. And on the left is the African group, a scholar who came to MoMA to talk about her research. Uh, and then the Central and Eastern European group, you see them on the left in Russia and the Latin American group, again, with an artist in our own collection uh, talking about works from Latin America in, uh, in MoMA's collection. Um, the idea behind the, uh, the program originally was not to expect a particular um, uh, work product. The important thing was for our curators to get a, a feeling of um, knowledge, uh, enough knowledge and sort of a feeling of being comfortable in art from areas they hadn't studied before to be able to propose acquisitions, to propose exhibitions, but we didn't actually require them to do anything. We thought if the program worked, it would show itself in our acquisition program, in our exhibition program, and that in fact has worked out. This is just a uh, sort of a statistic uh, slide that we use to show the success. Uh, by now, there are literally hundreds of artists and curators whom uh, the groups have met uh, in New York and on their travels. Um, the library, we have a librarian always in the group, and they've acquired thousands of titles, uh, mostly through people bringing books to New York and uh, through the trips where they're able to make acquisitions during the, in, in the places they visited. There have been 22 group trips so far, and we've counted 24 MoMA exhibitions. This is over the course of nine years that were affected by uh, CMAP activities. We have as many as 66 people participating, and the acquisitions, I think, in some ways are the most uh, impressive. Uh, about 1,400 objects have entered the collection through research that was done by these, by these groups, and that included 227 artists who had never before been represented in the collection. So it's really been a way not necessarily, not to have a specialist curator in, uh, you know, specializing in Asian art. We, we do have a curator of Latin American art, but that's the only uh, area that has one, but rather for the knowledge to permeate our curatorial staff. And it seems to be working so far. We have our fingers crossed. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this program. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions later on during the break. Thanks. Uh, we went on a little long, but I think it was worth it because those were all very fascinating um, presentations, uh, particularly the way they came at um, how, we, how we do cultural investment around the world. They're different different models here being used. Um, because we're running a little bit behind, what I'd like to do is open it to the audience um, more quickly than I might otherwise. Um, so why don't, if you could think of questions you'd like to ask, uh, uh, do that. Uh, the one thing that I just 
maybe want to run by our, our, our panelists while you're thinking about your questions is, to me, it does seem to be uh, the issue is scale um, in terms of our ability to impact uh, as many people as possible in many parts of the world. I think each of us has done, done it in different ways. I think uh, what uh, Edward is, is uh, proposing is actually now using you know, technology to actually reach people with this. Um, in your other, maybe look at our three panelists, how do you see what he's doing could integrate with, with what you're doing to reach more people? Well, I think, it's a, I think that's a wonderful plan. And you were talking about Dong Wang. And um, at the Sackler Gallery, they had a special exhibit um, with a reproduction cave, which was all done with technology. And you could hear the music of the time. Mm -hmm. And um, you could pull up um, li the little pictures. And then they might dance. You know, little dancers would dance and everything. And it was absolutely marvelous. And of course, you don't want too many people going to Dong Wong. Yeah. And um, so I think that all these technological um, advances will be terrific help. And of course, you can reach so many people all at the same time. So, um, you know, yeah. I think it's very important what you're doing. Thank you. Very interesting. Jay or uh, Joe, thoughts on that? Well, I think the whole uh, extension of the content based in tradition mm -hmm. is very laudatory and extraordinary because uh, hopefully those young people will want to actually see yeah. in the performative, live performance of what they are experiencing in the digital universe. Yes. Right. Yeah, and I think what's particularly important is the way you're able to bring in an audience uh, that ordinarily not, might not be interested in this type of culture we have a website for our program, we call it POST, and originally we thought it would become a very popular website. Mm -hmm. It has a very loyal audience, but a very limited audience. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the really important things is to broaden the, uh, the audience for this type of, uh, of culture. Yeah. Thank you. As, as I said, I'd open it up to questions from anyone in the audience. Uh, yeah, please. Honestly, I can't see anything. I can't see anything. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Wonderful presentations from all of you. I would like to raise a question to uh, uh, Mr. Chen. Why would Teng Xin choose to work with traditional cultural institutions? I know that Forbidden City and Dunhuang are all your partners. I know that the, the programs that you just mentioned have caught on really well in China. Can you elaborate on those programs and projects? Thank you very much. Apologies, I need to answer in Chinese. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, very, thank you very much for your questions. Just like our founder, Mr. Ma, he 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 mentioned last year in New York that Tengxin is a combination of culture and technology. We hope that by doing that, we can come, we can bring more value to our audience, not just domestically but internationally. To advance, to, uh, to advance mankind's art and culture. We have an internal statement that goes, the bigger our company, the more responsibilities we have. We're not only accountable to our stakeholders, to our shareholders, but we're also accountable to the general society, to the general public. That's why at the early this year, we we initiated a so-called new cultural initiative. We hold up against the backdrop of uh, advancing technology. We can, we can um, play matchmaking between art, artists and different organizations and to use IT as a platform to produce more and more Chinese cultural symbols to tell a better Chinese story to our global audience, not only Forbidden City, not only Great Wall, not only, not only uh, Dunhuang. We are also working with the Louvre, a museum in France, to use technology to further communicate their ideas to the global audience. 
in general, we're trying to combine, we're trying to take advantage of our technical advantages, our strengths to communicate better the cultural concepts, the cultural ideas to a wider audience. For example, the Louvre Museum in France. In the past, only people who have actually visited the museum can really appreciate the art. But right now, with the proliferation of technology, we can augment the experience to different audience on the digital platform. We hope that by doing so, we can inspire more and more people to enhance people's quality of life in general. By working with different cultural institutions, I feel like Ten Tencent has benefited greatly. For example, our manner has improved. We, we, appear, we appear to be more culture, we're more educated. For example, through pro working together with Louvre and uh, Dunhuang, I feel like we have benefited greatly in terms of our immersion. Thank you. I'm probably the only person in the room that I don't have my translator to understand. <laughs> so, um, other, other questions from the audience? Hi, how are you? My name is Stonlin Gao. Um, first, I would like to express my gratitude for the wonderful speakers for your very inspiring uh, speech today. To, you know, to, I, I'm very happy to see all the younger generation of Chinese to be here today, and it's most educative. And Mr. David, uh, I'm an alumni of Manus, a new school, so wow, nice great, to meet great. you. Uh, so my personal experience is I was trained opera singer for many years in the US. Uh, I attended Manus uh, to get my diploma, but all, not until the, uh, the recent few years. I started going back to China and my experience to experience the Chinese culture after learning the Western culture for all my life. And I realized what you all see, how marvelous, how important it is to keep the legacy, to, you know, to promote our great essence of the Chinese part. But meanwhile, you know, while I'm trying to get into some culture programs as for music, opera, and things like that, I realize there's definitely obstacle, um, as we all understand uh, China. Um, in, the, in a sense, I think it's normal when you, <laughs> when you involve two great culture entities. But uh, as for uh, doing the communication, like we want to be efficient, there's the government level, there's a private business level. I mean, there's so much. Nowadays, everyone, like we, as a proud Chinese, uh, besides the government, um, there's so many people wants to explore the possibilities to, to be creative, to contribute. Um, but I, my question is, uh, what, what you think, like what we can do as for channel, channeling the interest together to really construct some efficient work in between. And um, I love the uh, words I heard today from Mrs. Jillian, the culture uh, diplomacy, I think is most needed in nowadays. Saying so, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the question is about the organization of this because everybody has their own. They're off doing their own thing, and it may be that, and we've run into all sorts of different issues. Uh, do people have comments on that? Or where where the world's going to go? Well, I, I do want to explain that uh, here in the United States, producing opera companies have an association called Opera America, and they convene annually. Uh, and that particular organization is a service organization, and so uh, there may be programs and services inherent in what they do that you may want to approach and find out about. Yeah. Well, you know, I'd say you know, with museums, there are international you know, museums associations of, of various types. But when it comes to actual collaborations, yeah. they usually are done directly from one museum to another, um, and not occasionally with uh, you know interface with the governments, but more frequently just sort of one on one. So uh, you know, I would say in the future, the important thing is for the Chinese museums and the American museums to get to know each other better. And that probably involves more travel by museum people between, you know, between countries. And I think once that happens, the collaborations will start to develop on their own. Uh, I do think that uh, nowadays, with every organization having um, a website, 
um, it's, it's so much easier for people to get involved. And almost every cultural um, organization would like to have members. And probably it's not very expensive to just join. And you can find out what the programs are. And then if you're really interested and you've got some good ideas of your own, you can usually go to uh, meetings and you can actually meet people and sort of take it from there. So I do think that, um, you know, with some initiative, um, it's very possible to uh, get involved, mm -hmm. where in the past it was much, much more difficult. So, um, you know, I think that, I th and especially yeah. a company like yours, which is so huge, you know, uh, will help in this way. But I mean, every, I mean, MoMA has fantastic programs, outreach, and all the rest of it. And all you have to do is to pay quite a small amount to join and BAM as well. Um, although you've got some very small, uh, you've got some events which only a few people can go to yep. by the sound of it. But um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but, I, but I do think that the future is bright for people to come together. Yep. Yep, that is a great uh, note on which to end this. Uh, uh, and I want to thank all of our panelists again, as well as the Asian Society and the Beijing Contemporary Art Foundation for making this all possible. Hopefully the conversation about these issues will continue. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.